Well, no one, no one would have wanted to talk to her. No one would have approached her. No one would even want to be seen with her. No one would have wanted to receive something from her, and certainly no one would have had something that they would want to offer to give to her. But Jesus did. In John chapter 4, there's this powerful story, and that's, uh, it's one of where Jesus is traveling. He's been down in Jerusalem. He's traveling up to Judea, way up on the north side of Israel. But to get there, there's a couple routes. One of them is a direct route. But you got to go right through Samaria. Nobody wants to do that. If you're Jewish, you don't want to go anywhere near there. There was such racial tension, racial unrest. Wanted nothing to do with that. The other route is a longer route that you go all the way around. Took a lot longer. But that's the righteous. That's the good thing to do. Guess which one Jesus chose? I'm going right through where the danger is. I'm going right through where the risk is because this is Jesus. And Jesus, Esther, he has been walking for a very long time. It, they believe probably somewhere around 20 miles he walks this day from Jerusalem to where he will arrive at this ancient well. It's called Jacob's Well. 20 miles of walking. It's the heat of the day. He comes upon this well that you can actually even see this day. If you go to Israel with us next February or if you've been to Israel, it's one of the sites that they have great confidence. This is Jacob's well thousands and thousands of years ago. By the time Jesus gets to the well, it's already 2,000 years old, and it's still there to this day. It's at this well that an individual approaches him. This individual is a Samaritan, massive racial, t racial tensions there, it's a woman, and this woman is a complete stranger. Those are three strikes against the likelihood or probability of them ever having any kind of interaction, let alone any meaningful conversation. But again, this is Jesus. Jesus is the most culture-bending, culture-shaping person who's ever walked on earth. And Jesus didn't just come so that he would die for us. Jesus came to teach us how to live. He came to flip everything that was wrong right side up. And he's going to use this interaction with this woman at the well, this Samaritan woman, to teach us some incredibly important things about the value of everyone. Jesus uh, is in an interaction with her. They, they strike up a conversation. He's thirsty, clearly, from the long walk. He asks her for a drink. They start talking about jars and, and, and why doesn't he have one. And they talk about this well and they start talking about ancestry and all that kind of stuff. And then Jesus offers something that is really going to get her attention. And it gets deeper into a dialogue. And he says in verse 13, Jesus says to this woman, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up into eternal life. The woman said to him, well, that, that is intriguing, and I'm a little sarcastic. Why don't you go ahead and give me that water so that I will never thirst again and never have to keep coming to this well with these jars and drawing water. This is a hot day. It's hard work. I'd like a little bit of what you have to offer. So there's a great conversation going on. Eating out of the palm of his hand, right? What's Jesus' next statement? He tells her, go call your husband and come back. What a weird, honestly weird response from Jesus, right? On the surface at least. We'll talk about that in just a minute here. But here's her response. Her goose is cooked. Culturally speaking, she's supposed to go do this, but she says, I have no husband, she replies. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. In fact, you have had five husbands in your life. And the man you are now with, he's not your husband. So what you say is quite true. Jesus, the most culture-shaping, most culture-bending person in history, has just blown through all stereotypes, all cultural norms, and he sits with this woman who's a Samaritan, who's a complete stranger, and he has what really becomes the longest conversation we have recorded in New Testament history. Can you believe that? Shouldn't have even happened. But this conversation teaches us so much about the heartbeat of Jesus and the value that he places on each of us and how we should as a church do that for each other. There's a couple things. We won't have time to go through all of this because I really, in just a few minutes, I'm excited for you to hear from some amazing women in our church. Before we do that, though, I just want to pull out a couple little nuggets, mine a couple things from this passage that teach us about the heartbeat of Jesus. And the first one, it kind of comes into what we just talked about here. Jesus flips the script on the value of women. Jesus flips the script on the value of women just by this conversation, just by this interaction, even by the question he's asking. Go get your husband and we'll continue the conversation. I don't have one. You're right, but the conversation's going to continue and it's going to deepen. Now today, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mama's Day. That's what I've been saying to everybody out there. And man, how, some of you ladies, how many of you were in the VIP that was happening over there? Can you just, 
Give a little woo-hoo, yeah. Oh my gosh, I hope you feel as honored and VIP as you truly are in the hearts of so much in so many of our church. I walked in there and I said earlier before some of you came in, I, I, I was afraid I was gonna like turn into like a pink Barney if I stayed in there much longer uh, because there was just so much joy and energy and pink and balloons and flowers and goodies and I, I just love it. Thank you to the amazing team that made that happen uh, for all the women today. Leslie, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Just as a sidebar, Leslie absolutely loves the women of our church. She loves you guys and loves serving you guys uh, in a big way. And, and I just, I love the honor that she does. But it, it, what we're celebrating today, both with moms and with women, man, we're big on that here at Mosaic. It hasn't always been that way. If you lived in first century Israel, in fact, during the time when this conversation takes place, you would have experienced something radically different. Again, but for Jesus. Let me tell you a few things. In fact, I was doing some reading. There's an author by the name of David Werner Arman. He was a prominent law lawyer and a legal scholar about 100 years ago. He did extensive work looking at the Jewish law in the first century. Right around the time Jesus is alive, this is Jewish law and what it would have entailed for both men and, as we're talking right now, particularly women. Here's what a woman would have experienced in first century Israel, walking around about the same time Jesus comes on the scene. Hebrew women or Jewish women had virtually no rights to own property. So I'll give you an example. Mom and dad die. You're the only child. You're a woman. You inherit all of that, yes, but your next act required by law is to try to find a husband who as soon as you get married, he becomes the legal owner of all of that property. You have no right, no say in it. Beyond that, if a woman could not serve as a witness in any legal matters, you see firsthand right in front of you a murder take place and you're female, oh, that's a shame. Your voice doesn't matter in court in the first century. Only the wife of a rabbi or a teacher or a pastor, a preacher, a priest or something like that, only the wife of a rabbi was, would be able to be educated in the Torah or the scriptures that they had at the time. Only the wife of a rabbi, of a teacher. No one else could do it if you're female. In fact, it was unheard of, literally unheard of, to have co-education. Only men were able to go to rabbinical school to learn the, the teachings of the scripture during this time. Jesus flips the script completely upside down, doesn't he? Luke chapter eight, verses one through three, it says this, the 12 were with him, the 12 disciples, come on, Peter, James, John, Andrew, on and on, we know those names, the 12 were with him, but then it says, and also some women, and it goes in the next couple of verses and names them by name, there was Mary, there was Joanna, there was Susanna, and then it says, and many other women who were disciples, who were being educated by the teachings of the scripture by Jesus. He flips it all upside down. Men next to women being his disciples and learning the ways that they could never have learned before. Jesus flips the script on the value of women. Women would be held during this time responsible. They were held responsible for any and all sexual sins that would play, take place between men and women. Think about this in John chapter seven. It's a story where a woman is dragged in front of Jesus who has just been caught in adultery. It's a terrible scene if you're not familiar with the story. It's just horrific for this woman to experience this. They drag her in front of Jesus. They wanna stone her and kill her. And they talk to Jesus about what this means. And Jesus says, well, whoever hasn't got any sin, you be the first one to pick up a stone and, and let's, let's get this going. And of course, they all recognize well, we all have sin. Their heart has just been exposed, their pride. They drop the rock, they walk away. Jesus says, the one who doesn't have sin, says, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. The grace and the truth coming out of Jesus, I don't condemn you as grace, but go and be free from this, the truth that comes. He wants, the Jesus way is better. But notice this. For them to have an adulterous relationship, there's another party involved. Who is it? It's the man. Where is he in the scene? Doesn't matter. He's not responsible for it. She is. Man, Jesus flips the script on this. Jesus says in Matthew chapter five, verse 28, he's talking, this is the Sermon on the Mount, the very well-known, greatest sermon ever preached. And in there he says, I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his own heart. You wanna get off the, the scapegoat, be the scapegoat, get off in courts and stuff about the legal aspect of it. In the court of God, you're responsible for that, men. Don't you put the blame on them for your sin and your trespasses and your lust? Man, he's just flipping the script. First century women, here's what else they would experience. A Jewish woman was considered ceremonially unclean during her menstrual cycle. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> I'm just trying to relate to, to you. Never mind, never mind. Um, <laughs> 
Think about that. Think about the, don't think about it too long, but um, the physical, physical, but if you're ceremonially unclean, it's not just physical, it's socially. You could have no community with others during that time. It's spiritually. You could not go in and worship during that time. And if you would accidentally bump into any man, even your own husband, if your garment rubbed up against that person's garment, they became ceremonially unclean. Can you imagine the stigma that that would carry during that time? In fact, take it a step further. If you were a Samaritan woman, like this woman at the well that Jesus is now interacting with, there were these ugly, um, overtly sexual slurs that Jewish rabbis and teachers would teach that these women, if you were a Samaritan woman from birth, that from birth you were unclean due to a lifelong perpetual state of menstruating. Just an ugly sexual slur that they would do. So for Jesus to cross this barrier, to go past any social norm, was unbelievable. But this is Jesus. He flips the script and there's never gonna be somebody that he locks eyes with that doesn't matter, that doesn't have value. It goes on and on. And when they talk about even the topic of divorce as it comes up in this story, women barely survived a divorce. Unless they were linked to a husband, the resources, the legal protections, on and on, they would barely survive. So you think about this. Jesus says, you're right. The person you're with right now isn't your husband. You've had five husbands. What does that mean? She just had, she was a serial divorcer? No, this is something else you need to know. Jewish women were not allowed to divorce their husbands for any reason at all. You could be married to a snake, a dog, who was just sleeping around on you, and you could do nothing about it if you were a woman during this time. Conversely, listen to what this says. Philo of Alexandria, one of the contemporaries of Jesus' time, he's in in Egypt, and he writes this and says, the husband need not assign any reason whatsoever for divorce. Any act on his wife's part, which displeased him, entitled him to give her a bill of divorce. A woman couldn't do anything about it. A wife could not do anything about it to divorce her husband, no matter how wretched his life, what a snake he was. But if she burnt the dinner a little bit or, or cooked it, undercooked it a little bit, or maybe she didn't respond with the kind of tone that he was looking for, he could divorce her instantly. So we come to this passage where Jesus is flipping the script and he says, you're right, you've been divorced five times. In my growing up, and maybe in some of your experience, I often want to say, what a, what a terrible woman this was. What a promiscuous, ugly life she lived. Oh, really? Could it be that she's had a terrible, difficult life, but it's because of the men and the abuse that they brought into her life? Because she couldn't be responsible legally for any of the divorces she's experienced. Women would barely just survive this, and it wasn't because they were weak. It was because of everything that was stacked against them. And yet, in this story, here comes Jesus, blowing through all this stuff. In this story, in this most unlikely encounter, we see Jesus pushing through all of that by having this conversation with this woman, this Samaritan woman. Jesus disregards all the prevailing social norms, and he pushes beyond the ugly sexism, the superiority of men of his day. He flips the script right side up and reminds us of the value of women, the worth of every individual regardless of their gender. And thank you, God, that he did that for us, yeah? Thank you, God, because today on Mother's Day, on a day we're celebrating women, it looks different because of Jesus. It's true. If you look at history before Jesus, none of this took place, and he started to change it. And he does something different. He challenges and he corrects the chauvinistic posture toward women, and he moves his followers, those of us who claim we want lives centered on Jesus, he moves us towards something new, something beautiful. It's a community for all, not based on race, not based on age, not based on socioeconomic level, and certainly not based on gender. It's valuing all, all of us who are centered around him and his ways and what he represents. It's what Jesus brought, and it's embodied just in this little conversation next to a well. In Galatians chapter three, we see that the early church got it. Paul says, there is neither Jew, there's not a Gentile, there's neither slave or free or male or female. There's no entitlement that one gender or one race or one socioeconomic person has over the other. We are all one in Jesus when we have centered ourselves and made him our pathway of new life and redemption. The New Testament church got that. And that's what we are called to be as a church as well. Conversation goes on. Man, this woman is just like, Who are you? Wow. She says in verse 19, sir, I can see you are a prophet. 
I mean, there's something unique and different about you. So they go in a conversation continuing to talk religion, and they talk about worship, and they talk about the Messiah. There's a promised one coming, and it's just beautiful because she's sitting here talking to Jesus, has no idea, and he's like, I mean, he's got to be just nodding like, dum, 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 dum. this is so cool. She's talking about me. And it leads Jesus to tell this woman something that, get this, she, he has not told anyone yet. Peter, James, John, nobody knows that he is the true promised Messiah. He's a great rabbi. He's great. The disciples are falling around. They see miracles. They're trying to figure him out. But the first person who ever learns that Jesus is the chosen promised Messiah is a woman by a well that nobody else would want to go near. Nobody else would talk to. All the barriers, all the social norms would have kept that. And Jesus reveals his truest identity to her. He says in verse 26, I am the one, I the one that I'm speaking to you, I am he. That Messiah that you're looking for, you are face to face with right now. By the way, this is interesting to me. She was married, she was divorced how many times? Five times, so there's five there. She's now with another guy. A, a, a adulterous relationship, we don't know the story, but she's with another man that there's something broken and not right and incomplete, which is six. Jesus comes in the picture, and that makes Jesus, the number of, of perfection in the scripture is seven. And it's almost if, as if numerically Jesus is saying, you've gone through all these relationships, and all you've experienced is brokenness and shame and fear and rejection and abandonment and an unfulfillment. That's all you've gotten, but come on to me. Everything you ache for and look for and all the freedom that you need and the value and the purpose, you find it in me. I'm the holy one. I'm the perfect one. I'm the Messiah. He's the perfect number seven on this. I mean, her heart is exploding. Her eyes are open. Her mind is open. And her response in verse 28 is it's just priceless. The woman is blown away, leaves her jars of water Why she came in the first place. Reminds you of Peter just leaving his nets behind. Whatever was important five minutes ago ain't anymore because this man is setting me free. She runs back to the town and she says to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? I mean, this is the one that our parents, grandparents, on, 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 have been talking about forever. Did he just talk to me? He knew everything about me. In fact, in the message, another translation of scripture, it says this, he knew, come and see a man who knows me inside and out. He knows everything about me, but he doesn't do what I've always experienced. He doesn't reject me. There's something different. Is he the one? Could he be the one? This is the Messiah. She's so changed. She goes home to the village that has rejected her over and over, where she's felt isolated and ostracized, and she begins to preach Jesus. She preaches the good news. She preaches the hope. She tells them, anyone who listens, like the song we just heard, she cannot be quiet. She has to speak of what's happened to her. And look what it says in verse 39. A lot of Samaritans in that town put their faith in Jesus because of her, because of what the woman had said. This man told me everything I've done. They came and they asked him to stay in the town as a result, and he stayed there for two days. Those of you who, by the way, are watching the Chosen series, or some of you watching this right now, if your hand isn't up, you need to do yourself a favor and get online. It's free. You can get on YouTube. You can get it, uh, the app. You can download it right now. If I'm boring you too, mo too much, do it. Um, the Chosen, I'm serious. I'm not a big fan of a lot of Christian movies and TV stuff. A little on the cheesy side, a little on the portable. This is the most amazing religious Christian series I've ever seen in my life. I cannot get through an episode. My witness is here. I can't get through an episode without getting choked up and tearing up. I, I watch a clip for three minutes, and I get choked up and teared up. And I've been reading this book for quite a while, but it just explodes a brand new again. And the reason I'm bringing this up right now is you see a little bit of this woman's story at the end of season one and now right into season two, if you know what I'm talking about. It's just so powerful. This woman can't shut up about what she has experienced and seen. She wants to tell everybody about who Jesus is. And it says in verse 41, many more Samaritans on top of that put their faith in Jesus because of what they heard him say as well. Her story, his story, it matches up. He is the Messiah. And he sets people free. Now, I told you there's some nuggets. Just real quick, I want to give you one more. The first one is Jesus flipped the script completely on women. I hope you hear and see this. This woman who had been rejected is now preaching the good news of Jesus to the people around her. And she is valued in a beautiful way. No matter what the social norms of the day told Jesus to do and be, he came to change that and make it right. He flips the script. But here's the last thought. And then I'm excited for you to listen to some women with me here. Jesus isn't afraid of your story. He's not afraid of your story. 
We don't really know the details of this woman's story, do we? Honestly, we read into scripture some things. We think what an ugly, promiscuous life she must have had. But maybe you're understanding that first century culture, there was a lot stacked against her. We really don't know the truth, even though we have stereotyped that. What we do know is there's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot she's gone through. And we see Jesus isn't afraid of that story. Not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. I'll tell you, someone who's afraid of the story sometimes, me, I'm afraid of my story. You're probably afraid of your story sometimes as well. I can have those moments where I try to keep everything close and I'm, man, I don't want them to know that about me because if they knew that about me, the story might change. And here's the thing about Jesus. He knows that about you. Come and see, come and meet somebody who knew everything about me, knows me inside and out, but he doesn't shun me, he doesn't reject me. He offered me life like I've never had before. He's the one. He's not afraid of your story. You don't have to be afraid to share it with him. And the second part of that is not only is Jesus not afraid of your story, but it's actually through your story that Jesus often does his best work. It's through your story. The skeletons, yeah. The, the painful, yeah. The rejection, yeah. The abuse, the sin, the addictions, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sometimes through those stories, those marks, the ugly parts, that he does his most powerful work. You think about this story for this woman. It's her story that becomes part of what gives her the opportunity to welcome more to the table. She goes back, come and meet someone who knew everything about me. We already know everything about you. We know your story. Yeah, but he didn't reject me. He embraced me. He gave me hope. He gave me life. Come, because of my story. You know my story too? Come and meet the one who's changing it. The very thing that she had experienced and expected rejection from became part of her story of redemption, and Jesus uses it. Jesus isn't afraid of your story. In fact, it's through your story that he often does his greatest work. It's through your story that you often have the greatest ability to welcome more to the table.